Have you blown any bubbles yet? Surgeons are weird. There's no two ways about it. I, I really feel comfortable sat here with these three because being a surgeon on my own with you lot is actually quite difficult. Surgeons are weird. We do different things, things you have never done. We feel things you probably have never felt, and most of us behave in ways that you would never behave. And the reason you're laughing is because you know it's true. Yeah? So what I'm going to do is talk a bit more casually about that, but possibly why surgeons are different. Because what I would like you to know at the end of this is that although we are different, if you could understand us a little bit better together, we would make a better outcome for most of the patients we work on. So, the place I'd like to start is with... Uh, a little introduction. Hajime mashite. Watashi wa fushirosu des. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu. That is really bad Japanese, and I apologize if anyone is Japanese. We learn new words in medicine, apparently about 10,000 in your undergraduate career. We learn words and a vocabulary. Sometimes they're the same as you used in other places, but we use them differently. And those words become key phrases. Phrases that will change your life, phrases that ring bells. Crushing chest pain. Non-blanching rash. Hyper-resonant chest percussion. Do not stop. Go directly to doing something about that. We all know those phrases. And those phrases make a difference if you understand what they mean. Probably you didn't understand my very bad Japanese. The last phrase is important, Yoroshiku onegaishimasu, please be nice to me. It's an interesting Japanese introduction. But there are things that surgeons wish you understood because they affect the way that we communicate. This first concept is about words and what do words actually mean. Camille very eloquently told you about inguinal hernias, and I expect most of you know what the phrase is that defines an inguinal hernia. You can't get above it. My experience of teaching people like you about inguinal hernias is everybody knows you can't get above it. Nobody knows what it means, though. <laughs> can't get above what? And so they say, well, you, you can't get above the scrotum. It's, it's not that. You can't get above the swelling. Well, where can you not get above it? Think to yourself, do you actually know where you can't get above it? Can you remember what Camille said about in encroaching on it? Because if you understood that an inguinal hernia in a child has to be congenital, it therefore has to have come down the inguinal canal. Now, I know you don't know any anatomy. <laughs> You know as much anatomy as I am useful with an ECG. I can usually orientate it, and I mean front to back, but anatomy, <laughs> you guys are just thinking, ooh, that was an embarrassing period of time ago, even if it was just two years. The deep ring is up here. If you can't get above it up here, it must be an inguinal hernia. Down here, and I get to hold my balls and be photographed, <laughs> it doesn't matter because a huge hydrocele can come all the way up there. And that often gets confusing. Now, does that key phrase matter? Can't get above it. On the phone to the surgeons, sometimes I'm appalled at how far your patients have to come. I get annoyed when I wait an hour, but I suppose 18 hours is easy. I just go back to bed and it'll be all right. But you guys, you need to know what that phrase means because it may mean you're getting some fixed wing transport and flying a child a very long distance to have surgery they may not need if you haven't used the key phrase appropriately. So it's important that we understand what key phrases mean can't get above it at the deep ring. It's an inguinal hernia. Transillumination, as Camille very eloquently pointed out to you, you can transilluminate most things. It's a really cool thing to do in outpatients, to get a five-year-old boy, turn the lights out, and have him transilluminate his balls. They love it. <laughs> they absolutely... <laughs> Standing there, 
<laughs> but you can do that to an inguinal hernia. You can do that to your fingers. You can do that to most surgeons' heads, because there's not much. <laughs> Just because you can shine a light through it doesn't mean there isn't bowel. And the phrase I use to help people with that is, if I say to you, who is the father of modern cardiac physiology? The law of contractility of the heart? Yeah? Starling. What was his first name? No. <laughs> Which is good. Everyone says it. It was Otto Frank and Ernest Starling who both described it at the same time. And it's really important that you remember Otto Frank because everyone thinks it was Starling's first name. And poor old Otto Frank just gets left behind. <laughs> transillumination is brilliant transillumination. Only brilliant transillumination is a hydrocele. Key phrases mean something different. If I get a phone call from some hospital saying, we've got a child with a bile stain vomit. Do I need to do something about it? It's difficult because any vomit which has got milk in it and the milk is not the color you expect it to be, which often we don't know what it is anyway, will have some bile in it. So do we need to do something about it? And those of you who are educated will say it's a green vomit. Now, if I can pick on men, because men are really bad at this, one in nine of them are colorblind, what color is green? Now, the women amongst you who are good with colors, and there will be some men, but not many of us, will say, well, which green do you mean? And the truth is that there are lots of colors green. If I go back to the sexist, misogynist, patronizing, men will understand rugby colors. There's a difference between Australian green and South African green. Yeah, hmm, <laughs> in a big way. But green is a color that is a very bad thing to have in your vomit. As a key phrase, a bile-stained vomit, bile with green in it, is a bad thing. Because bile is actually yellow, which is quite weird. So key phrases make a difference, and they make a difference to how we communicate with things. Because if a child has a bile-stained vomit, green darker than the green of the seats you're sitting on, that means it's probably malrotation. Malrotation is in itself not a bad thing. It's a bad thing about to happen. I say to people, it's like a bomb that hasn't exploded. May not have gone off, maybe sat there for five days, five months, five years, five decades, but it's still a bomb. Because in malrotation, the rotation of the bowel is mal. It's abnormal. It's not normal. Now, this is something I've wanted to do for a long time. I'm going to get you to learn about malrotation. So what I want you all to do is follow me, because what we're going to be is the newborn baby bowel, and we're going to come out of the abdominal cavity at four weeks. So what we're going to do is this. I want you all to put your hat, just so I can see this. If you could take a picture, that would be lovely. So the newborn bowel comes out and elongates. This is the duodenum, and this is the colon. And then what happens is it does this. Now, all of you who went clockwise, <clears throat> are correct, and those who went a different way are abnormal. So what happens is that the cecum is down here and the duodenum is up here and they're wrapped over it. That's a lovely thing to see. <laughs> but the point is that in normal rotation, we have, let me do it right for you, you have the duodenum fixed here and here and the cecum fixed down here. And the big, broad tripod holds the small bowel mesentery fixed. But if your duodenum is here, the other part of the duodenum is here, and the cecum is up here, it's very narrow, and that can volve. And the volvulus is the badness in malrotation. That's when it twists, and that is when the bowel dies. And I'm sure my colleagues will agree with me, one of the most disturbing operations to do is on an entirely normal newborn baby, you open the abdomen, or put in a laparoscope, and all of their small bowel is dead. There is nothing we can do about that small bowel. So dark green vomit is a really important thing. But babies vomit green. The 16th vomit anyone has ever had is always green. So we need to know the difference between the first green vomit and any vomit that comes after that, because we're talking about malrotation. What is normal? Hands up, anyone who's ever written normal bowel habit in the notes. Come on. I don't know, really? <laughs> so maybe you've had some education from my great Australasian colleagues. There is no such thing as normal bowel habit. What your bowel habit is compared to yours, compared to mine, compared to what yours was last week, doesn't matter. 
It really doesn't matter because what is normal for you may not be normal for anyone. What is normal for the child may not be normal. And it's important that we figure out what normal as a key phrase actually means. Now, the really strange thing is that we ask the parents. Now, those of us who are parents know that most children over the age of five go to the toilet because there's usually some sort of commotion. There's often a bit of a mess, some smell, and they're away for a period of time. What they have actually done in the toilet, most of us don't really know because we don't go in, we don't stick our head down there much after the age of four or five, and we don't know. So realistically, if the dad, adult male carer, has brought the child in and you ask him, is his bowel habit normal? You could just as well be asking about his favorite footy player. He expects it is, but nobody knows. What is a normal bowel habit? I ask this to people and they say, well, it means they're not constipated. And then I say to you, what's constipation? Is anyone willing to go on tape telling us what they think constipation is? Because I think constipation is not what you think it is. That's how I seem to think now, it's what everybody else doesn't think. But constipation is not what you poo. It's what you don't poo. <laughs> Which is really odd, isn't it? So if you've got a child who poos semi-formed stool twice a day without any difficulty, they cannot be constipated, most people think. But if you've left 20% of it behind, then after five poos, you are bunged up. And some kids are constipated the day after they've had normal bowel habit for the last six weeks. And some kids can carry more poo than would be the size of a newborn baby, and they are not constipated, they don't care. It's really odd, so key phrases in surgery make a difference. Key phrases make a difference. Yoroshku onagashimas. Please be nice to me. There's a physical break in the talk there. <laughs> Giving it all away. The next thing <clears throat> is that surgeons think differently. You know that's true, don't you? We are different to you. We think differently. We think differently about pathophysiology. For us, if you give us a surgical diagnosis, the three of us in our minds see virtually the same picture, possibly from the same anatom anatomical textbook, but from the same anatomy. We can look at a thing. We can understand an anterior ectopic anus, a duplication cyst of the bowel. We can see and touch a pathology. We can draw it, we can usually operate on it, and most times we can actually fix it. That's one of the joys about doing pediatric surgery compared to adult surgery. Can you draw a diabetes? <laughs> no, but seriously, because I think it makes a difference. If I do an inguinal herniotomy and a problem happens, I can actually see what has gone wrong, even though I can't see through the skin. I have superpowers. But I know what the problem is because I understand the pathology of it. Can you draw me a half-treated bronchiolitis? What does it actually mean? We think physically and you think metaphysically. <laughs> you think differently. And it's really important, not when you're dealing with a patient with diabetes, because you know you are experts in managing that condition. But it is when we are working together on managing a patient on the intensive care unit after a massive laparotomy, whose chest is full of fluid, who is septic, whose white cell count is weird, whose CRP, who loves a CRP, not me, is changing and is difficult to ventilate. How much fluid are we going to give this patient? We think epistemologically differently. And that's really important even if you can't spell it or don't know what it means, and I only use big words to impress you. But we think differently. So when we are all trying to work together, because that's what we do, on the intensive care to look after this child, we don't want to put the child into renal failure. We don't want the anastomosis to fail. We manage sepsis by giving fluid. The intensivists manage sepsis by not giving fluid, not putting the patient into, into uh, cardiac failure or lung failure. And I've got news for you. The reason we have not got any research that proves the right way to do this is that none of us understand what we're doing. We are working from different epistemological approaches to try and figure this out, but we're both right and we're both wrong. 
And that's a real challenge. We're both right and we're both wrong. And that's this thing about being different. We think differently about things. We think differently. As surgeons, an operation is an expression of me. Now, whether it is my first wound drainage where I just popped a spot and you think you could do that, or whether it's a toffer away reconstruction after a long gap and put everything back together, it's an expression of me. And like every artist, I sign it. Now, not like that Muppet in the UK who signed the liver with his diathermy, but I sign the operation note. And that's partly why we are perceived as being arrogant. That is me. I did that thing. As physicians, intent emergency medicine slightly differently, but most physicians don't actually, by their own hand, do harm to people. Primum non nocere. We do harm all the time, as uh, we started hearing about. We do things, and there's a true joy, and I can't describe how amazing it feels when a kid comes into your clinic, destroys the place, runs around, throws stuff and goes, who are you? And you know that you fixed him. That is awesome. And I know that you know that for your patients too. And if you don't, and I, my real encouragement to ED physicians is you should follow your patients up just for that thrill. But let me tell you the other side of that, where you have to sit down with the parents and say, I'm sorry, when I was operating, I did this. And that is different. Because mostly, if you give the wrong drug or ask for the wrong drug to be prescribed and it doesn't quite work, it's not quite the same discussion. And that's partly how we feel. We carry with us those operations that didn't work. Trust me, one of the most humbling things I had done to me was when I put a long line in the artery and not the vein and didn't pick up on it, and the father said to me, you need to go and tell my son. And I felt like I was a six-year-old. And it was humbling, and it was the right thing to do. But have you been there? Do you know what it is to carry that sort of thing? Because actually, we carry that. That's what makes us a bit more weird. It's what gives us that really black sense of humor. It's what makes us arrogant, egotistical, uncommunicative, angry, sad, depressed, suicidal, and give up. These are difficult things that we do. And that then adds into this discussion that we have when we go on to intensive care units about how we discuss things. Because we all have biases. Now, the key and trendy phrase is a cognitive disposition. We don't talk about biases now. In 10 years, we'll have come around and we'll talk about them as biases. But we think differently about things, and our thinking affects the way that we make decisions. And it's important to recognize that we have those. My big problem is PICU. Put my hand up, because it's on film. I hate going to PICU. I really hate it. And one of the reasons is I am out of control. I don't know what's going on. And that patient who I care for deeply is now in a place I can do nothing about. And it, things are going on and I don't understand them. And I walk in the door and I don't believe what people are telling me. Mr. Fisher, this patient last night had this. The bugger they did. And I hear that in my head, so I say to myself, before I go in, I need to be good, I need not to growl at them, I need to listen to what they've got to say, they are not idiots. <laughs> and the reason you're laughing is because that's what you think when I walk in. <laughs> <laughs> that's not meant to be funny. I need to, I need to have a flag here that says, don't wave at these. It's difficult, isn't it? We all have biases. We have biases because of our experience and because of the way we think. And there are lots of biases, and my preconception bias is that IT are, are wrong. So I have to work back from that and try and figure it out and try and deal with that, that it's not what they think it is, it's what's happening to the patient, and we need to work our way through that. One of the most important biases is something called blind spot bias, which is quite cool. It means that you are able to look at a colleague and see the, the bias that they have that they're not aware of. We've probably all got that. Because if you have that, you don't recognize your own blind spot. And that's why it's called a blind spot bias. 
we all have biases. We all have biases about the way that we think about disease, about the way that we think about patients, about the way that we think about colleagues, and about the way that we think about interactions. Just think of that ITU patient, and I suggested we need to manage it together. How do we do that? There is no right way, there is a way, and it doesn't mean that it is your way. Surgeons are different. We think differently. We do different things, and we believe in different things. That doesn't mean we're wrong. Stereotypes. Who doesn't love a stereotype? All surgeons are assholes. <laughs> You've stopped laughing now. <laughs> It's true, that's what everybody thinks, that's because that's what we meet. And I know I am an asshole at times, and I know some of my colleagues can be assholes at times. Is Liz Crow here? Where is she? She taught me a great phrase. Nobody comes to work in the morning wanting to be an asshole. Something usually happens. And that's what changes us. And the things that happen that change me to being the asshole are complex. They are something to do with communication. There's something to do with the fact that people use key phrases they don't fully understand the meaning of, but then have acted on the basis of them. There's something to do with different epistemological approaches that they believe this is a problem and I don't. And we come to that point of conflict. And nobody likes being the stereotype. Trust me. When I walk onto the ITU and I can see the new resident looking at me thinking, here's the new asshole, and he says, who are you? And I say, my name's Ross Fisher, I'm the asshole you're expecting. <laughs> and they feel upset about that, but they know that's because I know that's what they think. Because the last person who came in there was an asshole. <laughs> but what we need to think is why was he an asshole? Why was she so upset when you got there? What is going on? Because if you treat me like a stereotype, I'll struggle not to treat you the same way. It's about communication. And communication, I think, because I'm not the cleverest person I've read about it, is the cause of more complications in medicine than any of the things that we do by action. It's about communication. Hi, I've come to review the patient. Notes aren't available, they're in handover. Hmm. I need to see the patient now, is, is the ITU available? Why don't you come back at nine o'clock, that's when they'll be free, they're doing a meeting now. Uh, because I've got an operating list to do. Um, we didn't do what you said you wanted to do yesterday because we didn't agree with you. <laughs> Why did nobody tell me? Oh, she's not here anymore. She died yesterday. We withdrew care. Did no one tell you? No. That breaks my heart. That happens to me on a regular basis. He's just a surgeon. They don't care. They just operate. It's just a patient. And that's what I want to challenge you about. It's great to laugh at surgeons. We're idiots, we're arrogant, we're aggressive, we're stupid. We don't know what we're talking about and we don't care. Here's news for you. I do care. I care a lot. I care a lot and I don't understand sometimes. Because it's different. I don't understand why there's aggression. Because it wasn't me. I don't understand why we have a battle amongst ourselves over the patient. Because actually, when I come to work every morning, that's what I'm there for, not to be an asshole. We care about the patients. We think differently. We express ourselves differently. We understand pathology differently, but we're not wrong. And that's a challenge to you, and I'm sorry you've all gone very quiet. But what surgeons wish you knew is that if we all understood that we think differently and that we're not wrong, 
that what we all want is for the best for that patient. That if we could get on better, go for beers, sit down and have a coffee, try and come and meet us at the door rather than say, we're too busy, we've got other things to do. And tell me about the patient when they die, then ultimately that will be better for the care of the patients, that will be better for our hospitals and everyone that we deal with. What's the bubbles about? Don't forget the bubbles. So the next time you see some bubbles, just remember the surgeons. We're a bit different. We're a bit aggressive, we're a bit stupid, we're a bit arrogant, but deep down, we care. We want the best for the patients, just like you do. Thanks very much, Ross. That was really good. That was, um, I think it's really good for all of us to hear that because I think underneath it all, we're all people. Um, and I think part of having you along with us and us all together is that we can try and break down some of those uh, stereotypes and start treating all people like humans and use manners and be nice. Um, so I'm sure we've got many questions. Mel, why don't so you go? Two interrelated questions from Michelle Davison. Do we think differently or just prioritise differently? And from Marianne Singh, if surgeons think physically, doctors, peds doctors think metaphysically, then in what style do you think nurses think? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the first thing is the difference between inductive and deductive reasoning which I don't fully understand, but Tim Horeshko will explain to you. But yet we do think differently. Mm. Uh, I think it's interesting uh, to recognize that, and it becomes harder the further you are from that. So when we're house surgeons, we're just watching the world go by. But if you think we were those uh, totipotential stem cells and went different ways, we can't then work back and do the same thing. We do think differently. How do nurses think? I don't know because I'm not a nurse, but I am aware that our teams work well together because we think in the same way. So it's probable that medical nurses think in a more uh, deductive way and surgical nurses in a more inductive way because those are the ways that we need to deal with things. But I don't know. I need to talk to more nurses. As do we all. Um, and from Ju Howe, just a thank you to all of our paediatric surgeons. Mm -hmm. Thank you.